What's the story, everyone? Welcome back to Gaelic Games Fan TV. How are we all getting on? The championship is back. The championship starts this weekend in football, in Gaelic football. Obviously, there is a, an Allianz National Hurling League final taking place uh, this weekend as well. But we'll, we will be focused on the football action taking place this weekend. Nine games across four different provincial football championships. We have the uh, Cavan versus Monaghan taking place in Ulster. That's probably the game of the weekend. Leinster. Round one, three games to discuss there. Two games in Munster and also three games in Connacht as well, including New York back. Of course, we all remember what happened when they played Leitrim last year. They'll be playing Mayo this weekend as well. So we'll be breaking down all the championship games, discussing them in detail, giving our predictions. And of course, for anyone who's tuning in, let us know your predictions for these games as well. And um, yeah, feel free to join in in the comments and everything else. And yeah, if you could hit the like button and subscribe, that would be absolutely appreciated. Joined by Seamus Brady from Onclea to preview this one. Seamus, the championship is back. It sounds a little bit wild because the league final was literally only a couple of days ago. But come Saturday, we'll be we'll be discussing championship. I think Galway and London is going to be the first official game of the championship, I believe. But um, yeah, absolutely mad that the championship is here. Yeah, mental and like uh, thanks for having me on again on the show. Like looking forward to diving into this. It's an absolutely crazy scenario that we're already here. Like match week one of championship, like the league, as you said, was literally three days ago. <laughs> like it's absolutely baffling that we're we're already here. Um but it's an interesting weekend. Like uh, obviously in a perfect world, we'd have a couple more weeks to digest the league action and like myself and Matthew were talking on my show, or I think it was his show, I can't remember. Um, and we were talking about how if we just got rid of the preseason competitions, we'd be able to move the league back and then you'd be able to give a little bit more space for people to build up to the championship and everything like that. But look, for 2024, we're back here again and we're fresh off the back of an incredible weekend of action in the league finals. So like, we're not exactly in the worst situation we've ever been in as GAA fans at the same time. So I'm looking forward to this weekend. Obviously, as you said, Cavan Monaghan is definitely the one to watch. Two teams that definitely had very different trajectories in their league campaigns. And um, yeah, that'll be a really, really interesting to one to watch because in terms of like the form books and everything like that and the history, especially over the last 10 years in terms of what both counties have achieved, you'd probably expect Monaghan to take it most times. But Cavan have had some famous victories over Monaghan, like let not forget their, their 2020 victory with Raymond Galligan kicking the late winner and everything like that. Like Cavan have had some good days against Monaghan in the last few years. So it's going to be really, really interesting one to kick the championship off. And um, yeah, looking forward to diving into it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and even on your, your first point you made there in terms of the championship maybe being so soon after the league final, I did want to touch maybe a little bit on that because... It, it is a bit mad that the championship isn't a little bit further ahead. Like it feels like there is no build up at all to the championship. It feels like when you when you're looking, you know, online or anything like that, or looking at the TV or whatever, it seems like any focus has still been on what was a crazy league final, and then the championship is sort of just thrown upon us. So it is a bit of a shame. Like it does feel like we're missing a bit of a build up. Like you feel like there should be like a, a proper build up week where there's interviews in house. Players are giving interviews, and I know there might be something like that happening on Friday, probably, but you just feel like there has to be something, like there should be a lot more build-up to the championship, and it is a bit of a shame, in all honesty, I think. I completely agree, and I mean, like, me, you, and Matthew have that, you know, that shared doc, and like, if you don't mind me saying, like, we're, we're doing that episode where we're going to do ideas that we have, that the GA probably should have a look at, and because that's one of the things that I've always had as a pet hate, is people that just sit there and complain and say this is wrong without trying to come up with a solution for it themselves. So we have a couple of solutions. Are they perfect? Probably not. And people will find holes in them. But we're throwing ideas out there and we're not like <laughs> we're people that are covering the games, you know, but we're not the people that are in the positions to make those decisions. But we are people who absolutely adore the sport and want to see it promoted to the best of its ability and want to see it get the oxygen that it deserves. Like as Don Logue said, her needs oxygen, football needs oxygen too. And like it's across the board in all sports. You have countdowns, 
you think about all the programs that go in before the World Cup comes around, every team gets a profile. You think about the UFC countdown shows. Boxing has their 40 days out series now, like where they do face to face and everything. And you get to see the press conferences and it builds hype for upcoming bouts. And yet the GAA, it's like, it's like you're playing catch up. It's like you're like, oh, sh- like it's this weekend. Like <laughs> that we need it, especially yeah. us making content about it like i already know myself like i have to get around to making my championship preview but then i also have to make my weekend preview for the first week and i'm only done making stuff about the league game like the social yeah. media stuff and everything so it's very very hard to keep up with it and it in my personal opinion it's just bad for marketing it's bad for business to not give yourself any time to let people get excited for it to let people get anticipated for it to let people think god this player is coming back fit because how many players do we have that are injured in the league that that means they're going to be out for the start of championship? Like mm. a lot of players are not going to be there for the first week of championship because they got injured in like round three of the league, which is ridiculous. Like league Anna won't be there because he got injured against Derry in round four or round, th- round five, whichever one it was. Like it, there's plenty of examples like that across the board. And my thing is get rid of the preseason competitions, move the league back. And then in April, I would have a genuine squad announcements day where each county comes out and goes, this is our 30-man panel that we're going with for Championship 2024. And then imagine, just from a content creator on the GAA side of it, imagine being able to react to each county's squad announcements and go, oh my God, like this mm-hmm. player is back or Connor McKenna's back from the AFL. He's in. Keen McBride's back from the AFL or Mark O'Connor for Kerry if he came back. He's in. Or if a player got left out, vice versa. There's a lot of situations that would be really, really interesting to see. And um, yeah, so from a business perspective, I think there is definitely scope for improvement so that people could get excited for it. But people will get excited as it carries on either way. So I don't think it's it's not the end of the world, but it's just, it's like, it's okay, but it could be better. Absolutely, yeah. There does seem to be a real sort of appetite for for non-promotion and even our good friend Matthew is here as well who says that evening lads according to Kieran McCarthy from the Southern Star the Cork footballers are refusing to do interviews before the Limerick game um, and, and I think I was hearing that before the Dublin and Derry game as well that apparently there was a few players who didn't want to do interviews and everything else and I don't know how true that was now but that, that those were certainly the, the murmurings that were going around on Twitter um, so yeah like there's there's a, a, another point as well there in fairness like about Core players not doing interviews and everything else like it's just that just that lack of promotion i think that's a little bit disappointing i know it's not ideal for players like in preparation for championship to be doing interviews and everything else and you don't want to bog players down with certain things but i feel like at the same time you know you are missing out on that chance of a bit of uh promotion no you certainly are there's no doubt about it like in i think it came in very much with the 2010s managers like First of all, Pat Gilroy and then Jim McGuinness and then later Jim Gavin with Dublin came in and had a, a completely different attitudes towards the media and like what you would give to them. And that changed the scope of it for every county then. And I think like Maliki Clerken was was on my podcast as just an interview. And he's someone who's like if there's if there's someone who knows about Irish sports journalism, it's Maliki Clerken. And and he was talking about it and he said he was saying he feels because Dublin were then so successful, what Jim Gavin he had implemented across the board in Dublin, that every county kind of went that way then and said, okay, well, if Dublin aren't speaking to the media, well, then we probably shouldn't either. And from that point on, individual promotion and individual interviews and everything like that from players is just, it doesn't happen. And if you look really closely, you can see it. Like Jim McGuinness didn't speak to TG Cahar uh, at the league finals. Colin McFadden sent to do it. Daryl Boyle sent to do it before the game. More and more teams are slightly going that direction. And it's like, I get it that counties don't want to leave themselves in a position where they get misquoted. And there is people that are in the media sphere who would do that. And there are people in it that would try and catch them out with a dodgy question or, you know, take a quote that they don't want to be defined from their interview. But the reality is, is that the game as a promotion is suffering slightly from it, that there isn't as much hype and 
Yeah, it's like it's like basically imagine trying to run the UFC without doing any press conferences. Yeah. Like the interest in the fights would go way down. And I think that's the GA is basically running on fumes that like people just know where the games are and what time they're on. But if you're not a GAA fan, like you're not going to be drawn in by social media content or anything like that. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's a conversation we could go on for, you know, we could do a full podcast and we could literally dedicate it. And obviously, it's, well, we are going to do it. <laughs> we yeah, are going to do that, yeah. that full episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's in it's in the books at some point to definitely discuss, um, you know, all the all the issues and the problems and, and obviously provide some solutions and everything else along the way. Like one thing I'll leave it with maybe is look, I do look at Sky and how they've uh, Sky Sports and even TNT and, and a few other companies as well who've made like a lot of the time they'll be interviewing Claire sometimes on their own show, but it's a bit more fun. It's a bit more laid back. To be asked, you know, they, they have series over there where they be asking internet questions and fun things like, you know, um, pick between certain things and certain topics. And it's not always related to football, you know, or, or soccer or whatever, you know, as it would be right. over there. And I feel like that's, like, something, that's, that, that's something they could look towards over, you know, in, in, uh, in GAA. But that's it, like 100 million percent. You've hit the nail on the head there. Maliki said the biggest problem is, is that like we're taking it as like, as if it's investigative journalism it's not we're there to have fun we're there to cover a sporting event that we love and we're there to enjoy these sporting events so why oh why are we asking difficult questions all the time annoying people saying they won't come back and speak to us again i get it if it's if it's different say if there's say if something stinks in a team say if there's a bit of, like this there's, there's some dodgy stuff going on like say for example in boxing like when there's clearly some like people avoiding fights, not fighting the people that they should be fighting, etc. You need journalists that are gonna go, why aren't you fighting the number one contender? Yeah. But in the GAA, there's not really gonna be any of that going on. And there are journalists that will ask players. So the media has to look at itself a little bit and go, Well, why don't players want to speak to us? It's because of mistrust, it's because they don't trust that you're going to ask them the right questions, etc., And then look in the mirror and go, well, do you ask bait questions? Do you? And if you do, that's probably why these players don't want to speak to you. Like you have to remember, they're amateur players. They're under no contractual obligation or professional obligation to speak to anyone. They don't have to do it. It's a favor every time they do it. It's not like TG Carr give the man of the match a blank check for his little interview at the end of the game. He's doing that, or she's doing that, as a favour to them, the broadcasters. So that's why if you go to Coke Park, there's dedicated media centres, because, again, you walk in there to be interviewed or to have your post-match press conference or anything like that. But then when you go, it better be respected that you don't want to do the talking there. And that's one of the things. There are certain examples there. When you look, like, for example, at the Dublin... Uh, post final uh, reception in the Crown Plaza. When you look at it there, and you look at just how many times James McCarthy had to answer whether he was going to retire or not. Yeah, yeah. Like you're like by the by the fourth time, I genuinely was watching, it being like, "Oh my god, will you leave him alone? He doesn't know if he's going to retire yet. Stop asking him. Just let him enjoy this moment." Stop putting the pressure on him to make up his mind. Like they documented that so well in the last dance with Michael Jordan, how every ground he went to or every court he went to, it was like, is this your last time playing here? Is this your last time playing here? And how mentally draining it was for him to answer that over and over and over again, being like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's because people are being driven by, they want to get that scoop first. They want to get that information first. They want to be the first one with the story to break it. And it's vicious. It is vicious. And like, like you've seen examples of people, like players leaving panels and then people asking players that are still on the panel, what's the story with this player? Why have they left? And it's like, do you think that that player is the reason that they left the panel? They have no idea why he left. So it's not fair to put it on 
a lad who is most likely in his early 20s <laughs> to answer a question for the entire team as to why someone else left. It could be family reasons. It could be personal reasons. He could, he could not like the coaching staff, but it's none of your business. And we should turn our, uh, uh, like to echo that quote, we should change our mindset about we don't need to always be poking at people and try and find investigative stuff and always look for deeper meanings behind everything. We should go back to cherishing our games and enjoying them, like really, really enjoying them. Like when you look at GA Goals coverage, for example, GA Goals coverage is fantastic, I think. If you look at like, for example, just how much Grania and the pundits like laugh together when they're on the the stream, how much they laugh together. And then at the end of the Armand Monaghan game, how they did a pundits challenge where they all had to take a shot from the 21 yard line in their slacks and in their vans and everything like that, kicking a size five football and the banter between Paddy Andrews and Michael Murphy and Mark O'Shea. Like it was absolutely fantastic to watch. It was so much more entertaining than super serious where you feel like you're watching, you know, the six o'clock news meets GAA. It's like, Let's bring a bit of fun back into it. Let's let's smile. Let's have a laugh while covering the games that we love. And I do think RTE are turning to that a little bit, but I would like to see more of it as a absolutely. fan. Definitely, definitely. No, absolutely. Look, and and there's certainly a lot that that needs to be um, that needs to be looked at. A lot that needs to be fixed obviously as well and uh, as we were saying before it's definitely something we'll even uh, dive into in more detail further down the line so uh well there are games happening this weekend so we better we better crack into them um there probably are a lot of games maybe that don't look that exciting on paper but look we'll still we'll still most certainly run through them but one game that definitely does look exciting is monaghan against cavan near neighbors near rivals um, Cavan have actually got a good record against Monaghan recently in the championship as well. Beat them last time these two played each other in 2020. They beat them in 2019 as well. Um, obviously, both of those two years, Cavan went on to reach the Ulster final, one of which they obviously won in 2020. So, look, it's um, it's interesting. Monaghan coming in on the back of relegation from Division 1. Uh, Cavan have obviously had a very solid season in Division 2 as well. Like These two will be in the same division in 2025 so there probably really isn't much between them monaghan playing the game in clonus conor mcmanus maybe be back into the side maybe conor mccarthy jack mccarron will start as well that you know all this obviously remains to be seen but look it's, it's going to be an interesting one and what would you reckon for this this one's very difficult to call i think because if you look at it like they both have had very much different league campaigns like obviously cavan started off on a blinder and um thank you very much <laughs> i think if that whoever that's directed at i'll say thank you on your behalf as well Aaron. um that like if you look for example at what cavan came with in the early stages of the league i think they won their first three games or they they definitely they won three out of their first four sorry and the game that they lost they lost to donegal and it was by a point and i remember that was 13 12 to donegal that was in they had home advantage but they still pushed Jim McGuinness has done Donegal all the way. And this was under a completely white-collar manager in Raymond Galligan, who, like, nobody really knew what to expect from Cavan. Very interesting backroom team, like Eamon Murray in there, like, you know, hugely successful with the Mead LGFA team. And then you have Stephen O'Neill in there. Again, like, what, what dynamic is he going to bring to it? Like, really, really interesting backroom team that he had put together. But then to throw on top of that, the fact that Garoad McKiernan had stepped away and the fact then that you know Connor Moyna I don't think was going to be there and then on top of that Thomas Galligan wasn't coming back and then Raymond Galligan himself <laughs> not being in goal like a lot of players missing from Cavan so to start it off going to be really really interesting I understand why Keane thinks Cavan are going to win this game because I can see it going either way Monaghan it's almost like Monaghan peaked right from the get-go <laughs> like they their best game so far this season has been that first game where they beat Dublin and Croker. And O'Hanlon's performance that night was majestic. But since then, it's been really bad. And I'm not even like, it's been really bad since mm. then. They have they got absolutely mopped up in like consecutive games against Kerry, against Derry, against, um, I know that Ross Common beat them out the gate as well. And then they lost to Tyrone and Mayo as well. 
and Galway at home, and Galway was comfortable too. That's not good because it's again like when me and you are talking, it's not the defeats; it's the way you lose. If you lose narrowly and you say, "Oh well, we went down fighting, we went out on our shields, and we know that you know just a couple of things change, we can come back." Monaghan didn't seem there at the pace at all. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Like, and and I think from a Monaghan perspective, like coming in on the back of six defeats as well, like all of all of which have been fairly handily defeats. Um, Mikey says if Monaghan play like they did against Tyrone, they'll win. If they play like they did against Roscommon, then it's Cavan's day. Yeah, look, that 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 is a fair point. And like Cavan are obviously coming in on the back of two disappointing results against both Armagh and Fermanagh as well. Um, I suppose a big thing for Monaghan though is like is McManus gonna start is McCarthy gonna start is McCarron gonna be in the side like I know like Monaghan have introduced a few younger lads here and there um obviously over the past year or so but you just feel like those lads are so critical for Monaghan because if they're gonna do anything th- this year like they're gonna need them lads um in tip top shape and I know obviously McManus look he's been around for God knows how long like the, you know do, it, it, is his body able to play week in week out and especially with the nature of the championship being so close to the league and everything else is probably not particularly good for him. But you just feel like those lads, like they, they need to come back in and 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 be available for Monaghan if they are going to have any chance, not just in this game, but also um, throughout the Ulster Championship. Yeah, especially when you look at the form of Donegal and when you look at the form of especially Derry, like it's going to be very, very difficult to beat whoever comes out of that game. So... Tyrone as well have shown flashes that they're, you know, could put a good run together this year as well. Like Derek Hannavan's form especially has been brilliant. It's going to be difficult for Monaghan to get up to that level again. When you see just how hard they had to push last year and then how many players are missing from that team last year that got to the semi-final against Dublin, like no worry, Began, who is massive. Like I know McDonald has done really, really well in goal, but Rory Began's just another level. Darren Hughes how important he's been over the years. Kieran Hughes, how important he's been. McManus as well, while he's still there, yes. You know, the questions, is he as fit, as you said, is he fit enough to go four games back-to-back to to a potential Ulster Championship? I'm not 100% sure. Uh, It's like, like, don't get me wrong, Manzi is one of my favourite footballers ever. Like, one of the most iconic points I've ever seen was his point against Tyrone in 2018 when it was he was pretty much on the sideline and he put it over the bar like if you're watching him you know exactly the one i'm talking about but that is six years ago like which is crazy but it's six years ago and father time is undefeated and eventually everybody slows down a bit and look this is the type of game that like that scoreline even there it's not a million miles away and it's not like it genuinely is one of those games that I'm not confident predicting it either way. I feel like if I predict Cavan and then I watch the game and Monaghan get a good run or a good start, I'm thinking, oh, why didn't I pick Monaghan? If I pick Monaghan and the, the other happens, I'd be like, why didn't I pick Cavan? Like, it's really, really a flip of a coin. Because mm-hmm. here's the other thing that we're not talking about that much. Cavan did finish on a low. Cavan got fairly, <laughs> like they got beaten pretty badly by Armagh. When, in a game where they could have leapfrogged our man to the promotion positions, they were really shown the, you know, the rock hard ceiling there. Like, you ain't getting promoted this year. And then they lost to Fermanagh as well in the final round. Now, look, they had nothing to play for, but they still finished the league off with two defeats. They'd done their work earlier, but they haven't finished off in the best of form. And Monaghan definitely haven't finished the league in the best of form either. So it's difficult to know who's coming into this in a better mindset because I feel like even though Monaghan got relegated, I don't think it bothers them. There's water off a duck's back. Because over the last few years especially, relegation to Division 2 is like, yeah, happens. 2020, Mayo got relegated from Division 1. They made it to the All-Ireland Final. 2022, no, 2021, Mayo got promoted out of Division 2. They made it to the All Ireland Final. Twenty twenty two, Galway got promoted out of Division Two. They made it to the All Ireland Final. Twenty twenty three, Dublin got promoted out of Division Two, won the All Ireland, and then this year the Division One Final was the exact same as the Division Two Final the year before. So this, 
idea of being in Division Two. It's not as daunting as it once was, and the, the cut off between the top half of Division Two and Division One is nothing. Mm-hmm. Like this year, I think if Donegal and Armagh had been in Division One, I think there's a good argument that they both would have stayed up. Mm-hmm. So, like <laughs> Cavan and Monaghan, if they had played each other in the league, it's very difficult to say who would have won that one as well. Yeah, it's interesting, all right. I think I think a lot of the time, I think Monaghan scenario may be slightly different just with the fact that they do have an age and enough team that maybe gradually is coming to coming to a, to the end of its time, whereas Dublin are Dublin and you know they're always gonna have one of the, the best teams uh, in the country. And um Donegal Armagh, I suppose Donegal obviously getting a new manager in there. But yeah, it is interesting. And even with that, I think division two, there is a lot of benefits to it. And we've seen, you know, Galway do obviously a couple of years ago, as you said. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if you see the likes of a Donegal go on a bit of a run. But on far says the Monaghan team have reached the end of a road, a journey, I'm afraid. Um, Gavin says Cavan have a great record over Monaghan and they're both Division 2 next year. So hopefully it's a tight game. Cavan have had their feet up prepping for this game for weeks while Monaghan have had to fight a relegation great. battle, says um, Mikey. It is, it is a fair point, albeit the Armagh game, like, if they had won that, they would have been in pole position for promotion going into the final game against uh, against Fermanagh. So, um, yeah, like, and, and Cavan's record actually recently against Ulster teams has been very disappointing. Like, obviously losing to Armagh, they lost to uh, Fermanagh as well. They obviously had it, they, they narrowly lost to Donegal, to be fair, and that was a, a close enough game last season against Armagh. They were beating out the gate. So, I think for Cavan, like, they really do need to put up a bit of a fist to this because. Some of their recent performances against Ulster sides has been quite disappointing, and Cavan fans will, will will be the first to tell you that. Well, that's it, yeah. And like I remember last year's how they lost to Armagh, wasn't it? But it wasn't the fact that they lost; it was it was a bad defeat. And um, but the reality is as well is like when you look at these performances and everything like that, Monaghan do have a lot of players that are young guns that you look at and say, okay, it's your time to step up now. Players like Sean Jones, players like David Garland that have kind of come in and out of the team but haven't really nailed down a spot like, say, Michal Bannigan has. But you're looking at them saying, all right, you know, Conor McManus can't do it forever. <laughs> like, eventually somebody needs to take the mantle. And you never know, a game like this could be the perfect one to go for. I actually think I'm going to go with Monaghan. I think they have a tendency to bounce back. And I think this, this might be, like when Clare last year got relegated from Division 2 and then beat Cork in the Munster semi-final to get through to the Munster final. I think that might be what we could be looking at here. Mm. And then that's a great point as well. Like, Cavan have real slip-ups in them. Like, it's very Cavan to beat Monaghan and then lose to Antrim in the quarterfinal. I know they're not going to play them, but it's very Cavan to do that to win a game that they're probably underdogs in and then really make it difficult against a team that they should beat. Yeah, like I I do have a funny feeling about Cavan though, in all honesty. I just think Monaghan coming in on the back of those six defeats, not knowing who's available, not knowing who's going to be the starting 15. I think, look, obviously they got beaten out the gate by Armagh, but against Fermanagh, like, I, I do think there was a certain element of Cavan probably switching off and, and thinking towards this this game, obviously, that was coming up. Um, and look, I think it's going to be very close. Like, it's a local rivalry. These, you know, form goes out the window. Um, first, you know, first round of the championship, both sides are going to be bang up for it. And I think if there's a battle and there's a fight, I could see Cavan doing it because I don't I haven't seen that much battle in Monaghan this year. The only time I saw a real sense of fight and battle was against Tyrone and against Dublin on the opening day. Aside from that, they've been beaten fairly convincingly week in, week out. Um, look, I, I backed Monaghan to do very well this year and they got relegated. So the fact I'm back in Cavan now to beat them, watch them go out and and give Cavan an absolute... That, that's the other thing as well is when he's saying having the feed up, um, Monaghan been relegated for the last two rounds. Hmm. So the they knew... Game, yeah, I know. But, like, they mm. knew we're going down. So you would wonder, did their attention slightly turn to the Cavan game? Yeah, it is a fair point as well, to be fair. Like, what does it matter? If you go down, you're already going down. <laughs> you might, If you win 
and because it's in such a tight schedule, like we've witnessed how quickly the form can just and how everybody, what everybody's saying about you can very quickly turn around. Dublin went in two weeks from being relegated 2.0. Yeah. Here we go again to, oh, we're going to win the All-Ireland. It's a write-off. <laughs> like, <laughs> and now we're right back to Derry are going to win the All-Ireland. Dublin, Dublin's time is over. Like, so <laughs> it's it's good to keep your feet on the ground. I think Monaghan, I'll probably go with Monaghan to take it. But as I said at the start, not confident. I wouldn't be surprised if Kevin do it. Yeah, Mikey's agreeing with me here. Cavan by two. I just feel if they can beat a struggling Monaghan, if they can't beat a struggling Monaghan, then uh, then why bother? There we go. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's it's one of them championship, you know, plenty of shock surprises that always happen. I do just have a feeling Cavan can do it um, with, with how decent they've looked so far this year. But at the same time, you wouldn't be surprised uh, if Monaghan gave Cavan a bit of a thumping because, unfortunately, Cavan's recent results against fellow Ulster teams hasn't been too good. We'll go from there to the West and we will have a look at some games over in Connacht and arguably the second most interesting game of the weekend, Leitrim versus Sligo. Uh, obviously two sides who are very familiar with each other. Leitrim promoted from Division 4 into Division 3. They'll be in the same division as Sligo uh, for this season, and um, or for next season, I should say. And look, Sligo will be slight favourites coming in on, on the back of that great win versus Westmead. Sean Caraboy and Noel Murphy obviously in great form. Leitrim obviously on the back of a heavy defeat to leash in the league final but albeit they've still had a very good year they achieved promotion um and i think maybe there's an argument focus start to shift ever so slightly to this game obviously taking place in carrick on shannon on sunday as well what are we thinking for this sligo will be slight favorites but when you actually look through recent meetings there hasn't really been too much between these two sligo have gradually have narrowly gotten the better of leitrim on a couple of occasions but largely it has been very close it has been, and Leitrim always, always give as good as they get against Sligo. And you think back to like penalty shootout in the 2022 Tolton Cup before Sligo narrowly edged it. Like there's never been much in these games. And to be honest, Leitrim have been the side that have been screwed over the worst by that league final being, you know, so close <laughs> to the championship kicking off. Because like just last Sunday, they were playing against Leitch, and now they have to face a local derby a local rivalry against Sligo it's not fair on them lads to immediately have to run back and you know get ready for a very local clash against Sligo where the rivalry is going to be absolutely roaring again as you said about Cavan Monaghan there's never much in these games um both sides are going to be well up for it if I had to pick I still probably would lean towards Sligo look Leitrim had a good ending to the division four campaign and they absolutely deserve to go up but again if that penalty wasn't given against wexford they wouldn't have gone up and um they did have some tough defeats against the likes of longford and everything like that which at that point i thought you know promotion had slipped away from them and um, you look at sligo on the other hand they were finishing their league campaign on a high like they beat westmead in the final round and that was a westmead side that had everything to lose potentially from losing that game that wasn't a westmead side that had taken their foot off the gas there was a westmead side that wasn't guaranteed promotion so for sligo to beat them by six points in markovic park is impressive and when you look at the form of people like paspalan sean carabine niall murphy like Sligo are ticking along nicely. I actually think that they'll win this in normal time. I don't think you'll need any extra time or penalties or anything like that. I think Sligo take this inside the 70 and I think they do it by about four points. Yeah, I think so as well. Like I, th I think Sligo are coming in with, with, with great momentum. Um, Obviously haven't beat Westmead. I think they've had a very good season in Division 3. Never look like going down uh, even once. Um, and, uh, and to be fair to Sligo, they probably weren't a million miles off of promotion as well. Gaelic Isis, I think Sligo are a better side than a few years ago. Leitrim won 10, Sligo 18 points. Keane says Leitrim to make home advantage count and get the win. Sean McDermott will be rocking on Sunday. 
Gavin says, unfortunately for Leitrim, Sligo were kicking on. Still good under 20s. Um, they stayed up comfortably in Division 3. Just too much for Leitrim, I'll say. And Mikey says here, uh, despite them both now being in Division 3, I actually think there's a bigger gulf in quality between them than when they were in Division 4. Sligo have beaten Westmead while Leitrim rode their, their look a bit. Yeah, it probably is a fair point. Like Sligo... I think both sides have progressed this year and both sides have kicked on. But just when you look at Sligo's progress from last season as well, and obviously playing in the All Ireland series, like the exposure that would have, they would have got, like playing the likes of Dublin, playing the likes of Kildare and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'll go for I'll go for Sligo as well. In terms of margin of victory, what would you what would you think? I'd probably go three, maybe four. Yeah, I'm saying four points. I think that. I just feel like, again, Leitrim, it will be hard to pick themselves up after a defeat like that. Look, the hope of, you know, going to Croke Park, it's, you know, it's against the team that they beat in Leitrim. Like, what if they could pull it off and only their sixth ever visit to Croke Park? And it just, as I said to you, like on our show, it just isn't meant to be. It just wasn't meant to be on the day. Leitrim just had their number. Three goals go in. That's it. Curtains. So... To have to pick yourself back up in such a short space of time for a Sligo side that are on the up, I think Sligo win by five. There we go. Uh, next up, London versus Galway. Um, I don't know about you, but I fancy Galway <laughs> for this one. Yeah, I'm going to go Galway here. Look, London is tricky. Uh, Roy Slip definitely has provided scares over the years. Um, but if Galway lose this, like... Forget about it. I mean, there'd be absolute uproar. Um, like Galway were the most expensive county in terms of like how much they spent on their county teams last year. They spent far more than Dublin did. They spent more than Limerick did. If they lose to London in the opening round of the Connacht Championship, yeah, but throwing the towel, boys. <laughs> it would. It would never happen though. Like even if Galway, no, played, this, the, I did, It would be the biggest shock I've ever seen. If London win this game, hundred hundred percent, hundred percent. Like, I suppose maybe yeah, London. What would you say, there. real quick? What would you say is the biggest shock you've ever seen? Biggest shock. Wow. Uh, it's a hard one, really, to to pinpoint. Um, Carlo Kildare comes to mind for me. Yeah, Same Carlo way. Carlo Kildare. I think Longford beat Mead in that same weekend as well. I remember that was absolutely mental. Longford beat Mayo in 2010 yeah. was a, a real what the fuck moment as well. Like. Mm. Cork, Cork beaten Kerry, Kerry twenty twenty. Yeah, that's it. That's a good one as well. It was huge, but having uh, beaten the all, I suppose. Yeah, mm. by that same measure, then that year. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that was absolutely huge as well. And another one that springs to mind actually that I remember down beaten Kerry twenty ten. Yes, and that, that was, was a good one. because Kerry were in their absolute pomp back then as well. Like, Kerry were the all Ireland champions, and down came from nowhere to beat them. And I remember mm. the, the funniest thing was. It wasn't like down caught them with a last minute goal or anything like they bossed it. Like I remember Mark Poland hit a goal after a minute and mm. they just dominated. Benny Kilter, Marty Clark. It was a cracking down team. Danny Hughes and Ambrose Rogers and Kevin McKernan and all like it was a really, really good down team. Uh I'd say as well another one that I real always liked. Um I'm trying to think of it now. It somehow mm. slipped my mind. I think Loud beating Kildare 2010 was an underrated shock because that set up the Leinster final, which then, you know, me beating Dublin as well that year, 5-9 to 13 points. Yeah. Like, that was a shock. That's the last time Dublin were beaten in the Leinster Championship. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago now. It was absolutely mental. I was but, nine uh, years old, man. <laughs> I was yeah. nine years old. That's crazy. It's mad. Like, there'd be, probably be fans out there that have never seen Dublin lose. In Lens. There is. Man, it's man, if you're if you're 13 years, years old, <laughs> you have never seen Dublin lose a Lens to match. Oh, you know how God. mental that is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Harvey Allen well, on the Instagram, my favorite there, one is in, Instagram didn't exist last time Dublin lost in Leinster. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram was made in October mm. 2010. That's so, that boy. That's absolutely wild. Absolutely wild. But yeah, Harvey Allen had a comment here from earlier. He said, Paddy Power of London, handicapper, plus 16, a 10 to 11, easy bet. 
yeah look there, there we go um <laughs> like a, a little bit mad uh betting on you know betting on this game or or, or whatever but um but yeah, like I mean, it is it is one of them. Like I remember saying to you in in your own show, like it, it is a little bit wild that we still have these games. Like, don't get me wrong, great exposure for London, great exposure for New York. But at the same time, I do feel like we should be having London and New York play the lowest ranked teams in Connacht every year. That that's just that's just my opinion because I don't know. Like even for London players, like like how do you you've been playing Division Four all year? It, it, like obviously finishing in the bottom two and, and fair enough like London have very little resources very little to go off of heard Michael Marr in multiple interviews before saying they don't have pitches to train on from week to week so they never ever expected really to even make a push for division four let alone do anything in this type of game but you're talking about one of the lowest ranked teams in division four playing a top six top seven team in the country like it is do you know, it's great exposure for London football in some ways, obviously getting the Galway lads there. But at the same time, it's like, is it really doing anyone any favours? I don't know if it is. No, you didn't earn it. <laughs> like, that's what I mean, is that teams have to feel like they've earned a crack at these teams. And that usually, t- that's a great shock as well. You have to... You have to think as well, like speaking of tip as well, I remember them beating Galway in the All-Ireland quarterfinal 2016. That one was a surprise. I wouldn't say shock because that Tipperary team was actually really good, but it was a shock how easy. That one was really good. Mm. That one was really good because Toronto were All-Ireland champions. That was a round, that was a qualifier game. Mm. Um, and it was Mick O'Dwyer's leash. <laughs> I think it was round two that they took them out. Insane. Um. But yeah, like it's absolutely mental when you look back at like, um, like London and everything like that. That <laughs> they're not playing against the Leitrim or a Sligo or anything that like is somewhat more within their range that they might be able to win that game. You're not going to beat Galway, and what I'm saying is, is that gives you this sense of then if you beat a Leitrim, then you move on to a Sligo and you feel like you've earned a shot at them. Right? If we can beat Leitrim, we might be able to put it up to Sligo. Let's be honest. If you're a London player, like you probably know that you're gonna get absolutely annihilated. Like, especially yeah. if Galway score a goal in the first 10, 15 minutes, like you're like, oh, here we go. Hmm. I'm getting a black card and I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you'll be back in ten minutes, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The old black card. Sorry, I stole that from Rory Stories. <laughs> Yeah, Gavin says Mayo, New York is sold out. It's just culture and tradition for fans, I guess. Yeah, no, look, it, it is fair. And the New York one, to be fair, because of the amount of Irish people. Well, that's a holiday, I mean, man. Like, that, that, yeah, that's a holiday. Yeah. Like, yeah. Hmm. like, obviously, a lot of Irish do live in London as well. Like, don't get me wrong, but there, there is a huge amount of Irish people in New York. So I'd say the majority of them are probably Mayo fans who are living in, in New York. Do you know what I mean? It's a rare occasion for them to actually see their team play when it's, you know, an eight-hour flight. Um, or what six seven hour flight, um, you know from 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 Dublin to to, to New York, but uh, but there we go. But yeah, look, we're both going to go with Galway to, to win fairly handily. Um, or uh, yeah, I think that goes with with our question. New York Mayo then uh, is the other game. Um, obviously hard to know exactly who's going to be in the New York team. Um, I was I was looking through an article on the GEA.ie website, seeing Adam Lachlan is going to be in there. Former Westmead footballer, um, so that's interesting to see. Um, but yeah, like I think Adrian Varley might be in there again. Jamie Boyle or, or uh, Johnny Glynn, I think, has gone back to the Go- the Galway hurlers, and um, from what I know, so yeah, look, I mean, New York caused an al- almighty shock when they beat Leitrim um, a year ago. You obviously won't see this happen again, but um, yeah, look, I mean, it, it's gonna be gonna be interesting seeing the Mayo lads. Jetting out on uh, in Gaelic Park, certainly will. Um, like as as Gavin's comment said, like it is tradition for Mayo to go over, and like it's a it's a good chance for McStay to kind of you know get some action into his players. If you like this, this won't be a like a very tricky one, and it will give off the feel of preseason game or an A versus B game behind closed doors. Like it will feel to Mayo like. They're running through the gears. However, it has got pretty hairy for teams over in, in New York. Like, mm-hmm. forgetting the fact that they actually beat Leach from last year on penalties, 
they took Ross Common to the brink of their lives in 2016. I remember, I remember Ross Common were Division One under Kevin McStay. Ironically, who's the Mayo boss? He, he'll remember it. And New York took them to extra time, and then Ross Common won. So it's very much like if Mayo put them away within three quarters of the game, they'll have an easy final quarter, and that will be at done. But if New York go into the final quarter still three or four points behind, it could get actually pretty scary for Mayo. And Mayo, as you said, Mayo do have a habit of making it really hard for themselves. They do have a habit of like, you know, <laughs> the biggest enemy to them is themselves. And like, I wouldn't be stunned if they made it difficult for themselves. I'd be stunned if they lost, but I wouldn't be stunned if they made it difficult for themselves. I do think they'll win, obviously. Um, but like what I'm saying is I wouldn't be surprised if they made a mistake or two in this game and New York had some good moments. But as you said, we don't know what New York are coming with. And again, that's bad promotion from the GA. We don't know yeah. who's playing for New York. <laughs> it's yeah. very much yeah. this is what I'm saying is when we're talking about the calendar and everything like that, the championship last year felt rushed. It felt like we had to get it's like do you know what I mean? It's like we have to get this done in the next 10 minutes, guys. Come on, wrap it up. <laughs> like, extra time, okay, penalties. Like, let's be honest, right? Like, I picked out these two examples many a time. Armagh Galway in the All Ireland football quarterfinal last year, and Limerick and Clare in the Munster Hurling final 2022. If you had a, had a replay for both of those games, they would have been the talk of the country for the whole week building up to them. Say Reen O'Neill and Tony Kelly hit that la hit those last points over the bar. Tony from the sideline and Reen from the free out near the sideline. Say they hit those over the bar. That's it. Curtains. Replay in a week. The whole country is talking about that match. Every GAA fan is talking about that match. Instead, we get penalties or extra time. And that's that done. And the the potential of those new eyeballs on the sport goes away. Um, did they? Yeah, and the, and the FBD, the FBD. Ah, yeah. I mean, it was May. I think it was Mayo's. Like, actually, I remember Killian O'Connor played, and there was a few lads who played, but it was more or less Mayo's third team. And look, I don't think, you know, I don't think they were even playing at one hundred percent. Do you know what I mean? Or I even mean, probably fifty percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, no, okay. no, I mean, no, no comfortable Mayo victory. Hmm. Yeah, I think so as well. Gaelic Oi says New York 13, Mayo 214. Surely New York couldn't. What I would say is that I do think this game will be closer than the London Galway game. Like, I think Galway could beat London by 15 plus. I really do. But I think yeah. Mayo, this could be under 10 potentially. Do you know, the, this does have the potential to be under 10 points. Like, it is a long journey over there. The pitch as well is a little bit unusual. Um, it does take teams usually who aren't familiar with Gaelic Park a little bit of time just to get familiar with it, the jet lag and everything else that goes with traveling over to the States. So, yeah, look, the, you know, there is the potential for, for Mayo to be a little bit slow out, out the gate, but I think without a doubt, Mayo will, uh, will, will win the game. Do you think Mayo go with their strongest starting 15, actually, or do you think maybe they rest a little bit? Because they will have... Russ Common potentially to come in a, in a few weeks' time. I think they'll go more or less the strongest team. I think they'll try to get it done in 45 minutes and then I think they'll whip them off. I think McStay will be too scared from nearly getting caught with Russ Common a couple of years ago. Hmm. There we go. So there we are. There are the predictions for the Connacht Football Championship. Let's move back to the East and um, have a look at the Leinster football championship so we've three games to discuss here first of all longford mead um i mean i feel like a lot of these leinster championship games here are quite predictable but longford i mean we all remember you, you mentioned earlier when carlo beat kildare um in, in 2018 it was that was on literally the same weekend longford beat mead that was obviously longford's last championship win versus mead and obviously um their last win in general so um discounting pre-season competitions so look i mean You'd fancy me. Look, Longford couldn't couldn't get promoted on the back of a heavy defeat to Wexford, and this should be this should be light enough work for for me. I'm not saying an absolute hammering, but definitely a comfortable victory. It should be because you think back to the 
2018 game again six years ago a lot's changed a lot of key players for Longford aren't there anymore like the McGivneys aren't there Robbie Smith like a lot of players that were important aren't really around anymore and a lot's changed like Longford failed to get out of division four which I was really really disappointed and I predicted Longford to go up in first place I really thought like this is a side that's been pushing to get out of division three for years and then they go down to Division 4, which in itself is a surprise. But then to not bounce back immediately, very, very disappointing. And, like, I don't see then how you go from that to beating the Tolton Cup champions and beating me who, yes, they are an inconsistent side, but they are working on it. And um, I agree with Mikey, actually. I'm going to say mid by six. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna agree with that one as well. Westmead, Wicklow. Westmead, look, you fancy Westmead. I think this game has been played in Port Leash. Um, should be a fairly straightforward victory for Westmead. They obviously beat Wicklow earlier in the league as well. Um, coming in on the back of obviously winning the Division Three title. So, yeah, should should be a straightforward enough victory for Westmead. Unless Ushie McConville can pull off a masterclass. But I think that, I don't think anyone can really see that happening this weekend. Yeah, man, like, again, similar thing with this. Wicklow, second season syndrome under Rushi McConville. Like, they had a great first year getting promoted out of Division 4, and it's just completely flipped on its head this year. Like, they never, ever looked like staying up in Division 4. Like, the, the minute the four games had gone by and they hadn't got a single point out of any of them, you knew they were in trouble. And um, the way that they lost to Offaly as well, like, it just wasn't a good way to go down. And, look... Again, how are you going to tell me that they're going to turn it around and beat Westmead? Although Westmead have a real habit of beating no matter who they're playing by three or four points. So I'm going to go Westmead by four. Hmm. And and the thing about Westmead as well is that when they play teams that are of a higher quality than them, they tend to raise their game ever so slightly, like even down where favourites like going into that uh, league final and then Westmead turned them over. Whereas a week previous massive favorites against Sligo and they struggle. So they do seem to have this weird, uh, you know, uh, they, they do seem to struggle a little bit when they play um, lesser opposition. But look, they beat Wicklow earlier in the league. I think they will be able to, uh, to do it. Gavin says, the people expect me to lose to Offaly last year is the thing. Um, but Mead have keep on, from, on from that defeat. Only thing is though, like Mead were coming into that game with a lot of negativity. Like they'd lost... I think four or five games in a row. Um, they obviously stayed up, but that was because of how they started the league. They'd, they'd had a very poor enough league, and then went it came up against an Offaly side who were narrowly missed out in Division Three. So it probably wasn't that big of a surprise to see Offaly actually beat Mead. But Longford, I, I think this is a little bit different. Like Longford are Division Four, couldn't get out of there, and Mead have improved since then, and their team has changed actually quite a lot um, since that since that victory. Mikey says Westmead have an all or in serious place wrapped up pretty much. Could that make them complacent versus Wicklow? I don't think so, to be honest. Um, I, I think they'll still have enough. Look, there might be an element. They, they might maybe um, not play to their absolute potential, but I still think they'd, they'd have enough to, to come through it. Wexford Carlo, uh, two sides in Division 4, but Wexford coming in with a, with momentum, obviously a bit, as you said, a little bit of an unusual one, how they weren't promoted despite that very heavy win versus Longford. Uh, I think they did beat Carlo earlier in the league uh, as well. So, look, I mean, the, there's not as much between these two. I feel like this should be the most competitive game of the Leinster games. But in saying that, yeah. you should expect Wexford to still come through with the form that they're coming in after how they finished Division 4. You would, but then again, like me and you have said many times, Wexford have a tendency to just completely do a 180 on their form. Um, Carlo could definitely catch them. There's no question about it. Carlo work hard. They fight, you know, under Neil Carew. They definitely make it difficult for everything to come up against. Wexford, on the other side, are very inconsistent. So it's difficult to know whether they'll come correct. If Wexford come correct, they will win. Hmm. Yeah, I think so as well. Like, and especially like beating Longford by by nine points or whatever it was. Like, they absolutely blew them out of the gate. And I think John Hegarty has got a tune out of these Wexford lads. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's just a massive shame for them that they didn't get um they didn't get promoted. But but there we go. Gaelic Guy says Wexford seventeen, Carlo twelve. Um, Gavin says they don't have to. They they don't have it hundred percent wrapped up though. Uh, 
they have to make sure Kildare get to uh, get to a final, uh, don't get to a final in relation to Westmead going to the uh, Talchon or going to the All Ireland series. Um, so yeah, it could depend on on potentially other results, but. Yeah, we're both going to go for a Wexford win there. And then uh, Munster Championship, two games to discuss here. First of all, Cork versus Limerick, and then we'll discuss Watford, Tipperary, um, Look, Cork. This, this, again, this is another one where it should be a fairly routine win for, for Cork. I feel like a few years ago, you were kind of looking at Cork and Limerick and thinking, could Limerick pull off the shock? And even then, Cork still comfortably beat Limerick on, on more than one occasion. Um Limerick have obviously regressed down now down to Division Four. Cork are obviously, you know, still still in Division Two, still doing their thing. But look, you'd fancy Cork all day long here. This should be should be a straightforward win. It should be, yeah. Cork have definitely had, you know, probably like the better league campaign. Cork started off rocky. Limerick, it feels like all the progress that they had made under Billy Lee, it's like it's just fallen like a stone. And um Look, I do think the local rivalry will definitely give them a bit of a kick. I don't think they'll want to go down without a fight, but it's a game that Cork will win. That being said, Cork, I have had this thing that Cork find it difficult when they're the favourites and when they have to go at a team and put them away. They find that difficult. Cork are very well set up to be like, you know, have a team come on to them and Cork can defend well and battle and fight to, you know, a victory over a Ross Common, say, for example, last season where they really gritted their teeth and found a victory and same thing with Mayo. But then you look at games where teams have sat off them, like, for example, Louth, Cavan, and Cork haven't had a clue how to go at them. Cork play with the same 15 lads, no matter if they're the favourites or the underdogs. And you can't have a one-size-fits-all like that. Cork have some brilliant footballers. Like some truly, truly brilliant footballers, players like Connor Corbett, Stephen Sherlock, Brian Hurley. They have to be brave in this one. They have to go, do you know what? We're the favourites here. Stick the chest out here. Like that's what that's what John Cleary has to get them to do. Stick the chest out. You're the favourites here, lads. Let's put these lads away. Hmm. Yeah, like I, th- I, th- I think to be fair, like obviously with Limerick playing in Division Three and the the lack of GA coverage that goes around, it's very hard to actually know how Limerick set up, but. Um, I would say Cork should still have enough, um, considering Limerick have, have lost every game in in in, in Division Three. Like, I'd, I'd agree with you as well. I think when Cork come up against defensive sides, they do struggle because it's sort of how they set up themselves. So it's it's an unusual one for Cork playing the same style as they have very much adopted under John Cleary. But yeah, I think Cork all day long here should um, should do it. And look, if Cork don't win this. Um, I definitely want to hear Matthew Hurley's rant on uh, on Sunday or Monday or whenever it is. It's going to be a good one, but look, it's definitely not going to happen. It's definitely not going to happen. Corker, Corker, going to win. Uh, what for Tipperary? Mad that the winner of this will be ten- potentially one win away from uh, the All Ireland series. So, so is the nature of the, um, the 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 championship and everything else. But yeah, look, I mean, I've saved this one for last because it probably is the least appealing game um with all due respect but look to be fair Warford did get a draw against Tipperary and you feel like it probably is a good thing actually that these two are playing each other because if it was a Waterford against the Cork or a Tipperary against the Kerry we all know what would happen there so at least these two are playing each other and look Tipperary I think should come through it but like if Waterford are going to win a game in the championship and and a game this year this this might just be the game well these are the two lowest ranked Irish teams in the Allianz leagues. And well, what's absolutely crazy is and there was one point that was made by I think it was Conor McKenna on Twitter. And he was saying Claire got annihilated by Down in the last round of the league for Down to go up instead of them. Like, and now yet, if Claire beat whoever wins this game, Claire go into the Sam Maguire Cup and they will take Down's place in the Sam Maguire Cup. Is that fair? There was always going to have, you know, there was always going to be permutations and everything like that from this, you know, pretty radical setup. Um, Really, really interesting to see what happens in this game. Waterford coming into it, obviously, you know, after finishing rock bottom without a win in the Allianz League, Tipperary did, you know, draw against Waterford as well. So they didn't even manage to beat them, but Tipperary did pick up noticeable victories 
I think it was against Longford that they beat them. So it was one of them, yeah. Carl, yeah, maybe. and they, they gave Leash an awful scare as well in Temple Stadium. So Tip have definitely shown me more. I think just you know the play, the fact that they still have players with the caliber of Sean O'Connor, Stephen O'Brien, the fact that they still have that tells me that they'll win. And as Mikey says, you have to feel sorry for Down because then you would back Claire to beat Tip in the semi final and book their Sam Maguire Cup place. Absolutely, yeah. Like you're talking about a side who played Division Two last year. Obviously, Clare have lost a lot of players, but nearly got out of Division Three versus, as you said, one of the lowest ranked teams, you know, across the the country. Like so, um, so there we go. But um, but yeah, Gavin says Tip been in two All Ireland semis in the last ten years. Real fall from grace. Um, yeah, it's mental. Like Tipperary have played in two All Ireland semi finals since 2016 Donegal have played in zero in that time um do you know like it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mad statistic right there but uh but there we go and I didn't mean to throw any shade to Donegal <laughs> it's just something I thought of right there but yeah look it's it, it is absolutely mad but ultimately would you back Tipperary to come through it or, or what do you reckon yeah, I back I back Tipperary just based off the fact that I said that they they showed me more um like Sean O'Connor is still there. They still have the likes of Jack Kennedy and everything. And I think those players will be enough if they're fit and if they're healthy and ready to go. It'll be enough to make the difference in this one. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll go for Tipperary to come through it as well. So that very much wraps it up. Um, in terms of Player of the Week, Bet of the Week, what would you be thinking? There's not really many bets of the week, really, is there? Uh, bets of the week. The even games. Like outside bet, are we saying again? Outside bet, yeah. Or just uh, Outside uh, bet. Prize of the week or whatever we you want to phrase it. Outside bet, Carlo, to to win their game. Mm-hmm. Outside bet, Carlo to beat uh, Wexford. Yeah, Wexford. Sorry, I got mixed up with Longford. <laughs> Outside bet, Carlo to be Wexford, and then player of the week. Um, player of the week, I probably got Matthew Costello. I feel like Matthew Costello usually plays well when Meath win. Mm. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, or oh, actually, wait, wait, Mayo Galway. I could see one of their forwards going on a little. Rob um, Rob Finnerty actually. Rob Finnerty yeah. usually kicks a load when Galway hammer it in. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think for me, I'd go. I've obviously gone with Cavan to be Monaghan. I think Monaghan will, will will be slight favourites in that game, so I think that's a a bet of the week. And then I go Paddy Lynch as well because if Cavan are to win that game, I think he he will have a, a stormer. I'm pretty sure about it. Um, Cavan had an interesting comment here. Leitrim under twenty just bet um, Mayo. I'll have to look into that. That'd be absolutely wild if uh, if that happens. Um, well, yeah, are on you. Yeah, there you go. Fair play, fair play. That's not really, not really great for Mayo. Um, if that is the case, because like a lot of their lads were part of that minor all or the winning team from a couple of years ago. But fair play to Leitrim, and look, that's what you like. It's it's not really got to do with Mayo, but that's what you want to see. You want to see new teams coming along. Sligo under twenties doing well. Um, awfully under twenties in previous years. So that that you know that's what you that's what you want to see is new teams come to the fore. So yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like, I mean, if you can see more of that, like, the more that we see, the better for the championship. And that's why, like, me and you were saying there, like, you'd think that as dubs, me and you would be like pissed off about the league final and everything like that. Like, I'm sitting there thinking, great, we've got a competitor, we've got a new team who can win in all Ireland here, and that's going to make things very, very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like, come championship time, you look at how boring the Leinster championship has been. How good would it be to see, you know, real competitors to Dublin's town in Leinster? Absolutely. And just looking at it on score, be, oh, yeah, Leitrim beat Mayo 312 to 16. So, look, fair play, fair play to, uh, to to Leitrim. And maybe it could be a sign of things to come for this weekend. Um, but we'll see what happens. But, yeah, Seamus, very much appreciate you uh, jumping on. Anyone who tuned in, much appreciated. I will be dropping my All Ireland Football Championship predictions tomorrow at some stage. So stay tuned for that. And um, yeah, anyone who tuned in, if you could hit the like button and subscribe, that'd be very much appreciated. And we'll speak to you all again. <laughs>